If we're going to come up with a model for how light transports through turbid tissue, we have to start from the fundamentals. And that's to think about how light traveling through a small volume dV is going to be altered as it tries to fly through. So let's start sketching various things that happen. We have some light in from this side over here traveling in a particular direction, which I will call omega hat. So we have light traveling from the left to the right. One thing that can happen, of course, is that the light actually gets through. But there are a bunch of interactions that can also happen inside of the volume. One of them is that as a photon tries to get through, it gets absorbed. I'll mark that with a black dot. Okay, so there could be absorption. The next thing that can happen is that a photon trying to get through hits a scatterer, which I'll mark with a open circle, and then the photon scatters off and is no longer traveling in the in direction, in the omega hat direction. So that photon's been lost, and I'm going to name that outscatter because this photon has stopped traveling in the direction that it was originally traveling. So it's no longer part of the population of photons flying directly in direction omega hat. A third thing that can happen is that a photon somewhere else in the medium not traveling at direction omega hat could come into this volume, scatter off of another scatterer, and then leave in the direction omega hat. And so I'm going to call that in scatter. That's actually a gain. And the fourth thing that can happen is there might be a source. I'm going to mark that with a little with an explosion here. There could be a source of new scattered photons from somewhere, as we'll discuss. And that light could also be produced inside of DV. And as it, it were, join the beam having in direction omega hat. And this is shown uh, in the book in figure 9.3. So this is the basic stuff that's happening that we want to model mathematically. Let's set up the geometry here. We're going to need a bunch of labels for all of this, so our, our system has to have some sort of origin because we're going to be wanting to discuss the light distribution at many locations in a tissue. So we have to have a location vector, R, that tells us which particular location in the tissue are we looking at right now. So here's that location. And then we have to draw a little volume around it. This is the same volume here that we just drew over here. And then we have to think about a direction for the light that we want to study, I'll continue to use this horizontal direction here so we can think about light heading in this capital omega hat direction. And we're looking within a certain range of solid angle. And I'll indicate that by drawing a little sort of cone here. And that differential amount of angle is the solid angle chunk d omega. So we've set up our system where we can specify where we are, what direction the light is heading in. And now you're wondering, well, what exactly is this quantity that we're trying to specify at this point? And that's referred to by this quantity that we'll call, and it's called in the book, U. And it's a sort of energy density. So it's an energy density at a particular location. It's an ensemble of photons heading in a certain overall direction, and this quantity can be time dependent. If I pulse my light source, I'm not going to have U be constant. And the, the way we would refer to this is that it's the energy. It's the energy present per unit volume, and also per unit solid angle. And the units of that would be joules, energy, per cubic meter, that's volume, and SR standing for steradian. So if I want to find out how much energy is on inside this little box, dV, 
heading in a particular direction within a certain solid angle, I have to multiply by the differential amount of solid angle that I have and by the amount of volume that I have. And then I will have an energy in joules. Fine. That doesn't really probably make you happy because the question or that we want to explore here is what is the rate of change of this quantity? What is the time derivative of this energy per unit volume per unit solid angle? That's what we've got to account for by all of these things going on in the box here. These are all the ways that that U value can change. So let's start listing them. So first of all, you can have what I will call collision driven change. We could also call this interaction driven change. So one of the ways that in a small amount of time there can be a small amount of change in U. So the change in U over some change in time. Well, first of all, the more light we have, the more loss we can have due to absorption and outscatter. So there's that proportionality. So the change is going to be proportional to how much U we, we had at the beginning. So however many photons there are flying in this particular direction, in this particular location, the more there are, the more loss I can have. And I want a time unit now, so delta U, delta T. What's my one over time? Well, I'm going to be multiplying here. The thing that should go in here should be the probability of interaction versus time. That sounds a little weird. What do I mean by that? Well, so what's that probability? We know a few things about probabilities already in this class. We know that the differential probability of interaction per unit length, I'll just call that dx, we know what this rate is. This is given by the absorption coefficient plus the scattering coefficient. That's exactly how they're defined. But we want the probability of interaction, the rate of that with respect to time. So we'd have to multiply this probability by dx dt. Then we'd get d probability dt. But we know what dx dt is. That's just the speed that the photons are flying at. And that velocity in the book is called c sub n. I'll just remind you that that's equal to the speed of light in vacuum divided by the refractive index in the medium. So that's exactly what we should multiply by. We multiply this by the speed of light in the medium, and then we multiply it by mu a plus mu s. I'm writing that in bra square brackets because we have a lot of functional dependences that I will be using the parentheses for. So square brackets means it's just a multiplication of what's inside. The only thing missing here is that since Outscatter and absorption are loss terms. We need to put a minus sign in front here. Okay, so that's our collision driven loss. Now we also can have in scatter over here, and that's going to be a similar flavored term to what we to the term for scattering that we've got here. What are the changes going to be though? No minus sign here. This is going to be a plus sign. But we've still got the speed term. We've still got the mu s term. There's not going to be a corresponding mu a term because you can't have in absorption. We're going to save that and call it a source term. And the other thing is that there's not just one direction that outside photons traveling other directions can be coming in. So we have to do an integral. We have to integrate over all four pi directions of all the possible U values. We've got different populations of photons heading in different directions. So we're thinking about U still at this location, but light traveling in different directions and traveling, of course, at the same time 
moment. And then we have to multiply this by something called the phase function. And I'm not going to talk too much about it right here, but this is the probability given that there's a scattering event, what's the likelihood that it heads off in this particular direction? So this dot product here is capturing the likelihood that a photon heading in a particular direction will join our U beam that we've specified here in direction omega hat. And then we have to integrate over all possible income directions. So we draw, uh, integrate over all solid angle. So I won't say much more about, about this term right now, but I'll, I'll, I'll box this one up and say that's our in-scatter du dt contribution. Just like this one over here is our outscatter and absorption loss contribution. The third term is pretty quick. That's the source term. We're simply going to name this with a quantity q, as it's called in the book. So it's any sources at this location that are producing new scattered light that can join the scattered light beam heading in exactly that direction. And the units of sources are the same units of du dt. So instead of joules per unit volume in steradian, it's joules per second or watts per volume and steradian. This is all pretty straightforward. The the fourth term is the one that you probably haven't thought about as much, and I'm going to call that gradient-driven change. You could also call this diffusion. And I'm simply going to motivate this with the idea of a beaker of water in which I might have a little capsule, say, of food coloring or dye, something like that. So at an initial time, if I break open this capsule of dye right here, all of the U, obviously here I would be thinking of, in, for light, I would be pulsing a light source right there. So I have a light source that's glowing right there. At the initial time, there's only going to be light right in the center. And then if I look later and I draw that same beaker, what I'm going to have is a distribution. You all are very well aware that the, the, the dye molecules will start to wander around. And what's going to happen is that I'm going to have more in the center than anywhere else, because that's where a random walk is going to have its most likely contribution. But there's going to be a sort of continuous gradient flowing outward like that. So this is the essential thing that we're assuming is happening with these photons. This is what we would call diffusion. And what are we asserting here? We're asserting that at the initial time, the fact that there's lots of U here and very little U out here drives an overall flow of energy from the high energy region to the low energy region. And if you look at that spatially in three dimensions, what we're talking about is that there's this gradient of this field U. Write that down. And, note, and as you know, the gradient is a vector. So this is a vector field that we're talking about here. U is greatest at the center here. So the slope versus distance, if you will, is positive if we're heading towards there and negative if we're heading away from there. So the gradient vector is going to be pointing towards the center. So the flow of energy, is a, which is away from the center, says that we would apply a minus sign on that. We don't want a vector in this problem. Everything else that we've got up here are scalar quantities. How do we get this to be a scalar quantity? We can multiply the gradient by the direction that we're interested in the flow of. U is the population of scattered light that's heading in a particular direction. So if we take the dot product between the gradient and the direction we're interested in, we now get a, a scalar corresponding to the direction we want. And it's, again, thinking about the flow in that direction. Now, if you look at the units of this, this is a spatial derivative of u, and we want a temporal derivative of u. We've already encountered that problem over here, where we had mu a and mu s were spatial derivatives of, of probability, and we want 
temporal ones we multiply by the speed of light. So it turns out that the extra term that we come up with here, we multiply by the speed of light in the medium, and then we take this dot product here, and this is the temporal derivative that we wanted. So this term right here becomes our fourth term. I didn't put a green box around the third term. So these three green boxes and this sort of special new term in the red box, these are the four terms that go into a, an equation called the Boltzmann transport equation. And what the Boltzmann transport equation says is that the change in u, this u quantity, which has dependence on position, solid angle, and time, that things that affect its change versus time are term 1 plus term 2 plus term 3 plus term 4. And what we'll want to keep track of is that term 1, that's always going to be a loss term, negative. Term 2 is always positive, because you are because you can only gain in the scatter. Term 3, also positive, you can only gain from sources. We don't have for sources of negative photons. Term 4 is the more interesting one, and I'm just going to write here that it depends. And the reason why it depends is because depending where you are in the medium, the gradient could be a positive number or a negative number as a function of time and space. So this one we're going to have to talk about more. And that is the story of getting us started with how to write a governing equation, which, if you're interested, does not manage to be derived directly from electromagnetic theory. It's what's called a heuristic equation that we sort of write based on our instincts. And this puts us in position to manipulate this and get to eventually a diffusion equation.